Greetings and welcome to this presentation, Blessed Michael McGivney, The Baltimore Years. This is the fourth in a series of biographical sessions about the life and experiences of the recently beatified Father Michael McGivney, who was a Connecticut priest and the founder of the Knights of Columbus. These programs are presented by the Blessed Michael McGivney Pilgrimage Center, which is in New Haven, Connecticut. And we welcome all of you who are part of our audience tonight. This online presentation is being recorded February 24th, 2021, and it will be available for uh, viewing later on demand on the YouTube channel for the Blessed Michael McGivney Center, as well as on the McGivney Center's Facebook page. Uh, viewers are welcome to submit questions at any time during the presentation. There's a utility on the right side of your screen. If you click the question mark, you can type in a, uh, a question for us, and I will monitor that throughout the program and uh, address questions to our presenter as we uh, conclude his, his um, presentation. I will also share that there is a resource sheet that you can download. It has many useful links about Father McGivney as well as about uh, St. Mary's Spiritual Center and the site where Father McGivney spent his seminary years in Baltimore. Uh, before introducing our presenter tonight, I ask your prayers for Deacon Vito Piazza, the director of St. Mary's Spiritual Center and historic site. Vito had a sudden emergency and it prevented him from sharing the information he prepared about Father McGivney's experiences in Baltimore. Uh, so he, uh, he kindly asked his associate, Blaine Carvalho, to join us. Blaine is the administrator of St. Mary's Spiritual Center. He's the Connecticut native. He holds degrees from Bryant University, which is in Rhode Island, as well as the University of Baltimore and he's previously served in the Peace Corps as an economic advisor in Estonia, and later in the Diplomatic Corps with the Embassy of the Republic of Estonia. Blaine, we're delighted and uh, we welcome you. Thank you for your kindness in offering this presentation in Vito's stead. Uh, I know you contributed much to the presentation and uh, I, I'm sure that it's, uh, it's something that's very familiar with you. Well, thank you very much, Peter. Yes, we always pride ourselves down at Packer Street to be flexible, and this is a great example of that. And uh, thank you for your prayer for Vito. I can tell you at the at this moment, actually, probably about 15 minutes ago, he did arrive home, and he's doing well, and hopefully he's watching this as well with his wife, Doris. So well, thank you for your prayers, and uh, yeah, we're looking forward to this, so really excited about contributing this part of Michael McGivney's story. Well, as your title slide indicates, Father McGivney was a seminarian in Baltimore at St. Mary's in the late 19th century, uh, 1873 to 1877. This wasn't the first place that he uh, studied for the priesthood. He had, he had gone to Canada for a little bit and he'd also gone to Western New York, but he, uh, he was assigned to St. Mary's by his bishop uh, to complete his seminary studies. And I'm gonna turn the program over to you because you've done a lot of preparation and please share with us uh, what you believe Father McGivney's experiences were like in Baltimore. And also uh, share with the audience how significant the city of Baltimore was as the first, uh, the, the see, the first uh, diocese, if you will, in the United States. Okay, well, thank you very much, Peter. First of all, I wanna tell the audience where I'm sitting right now. So. I am sitting at Blessed Michael J. McGivney's alma mater. And if you look to the left of your screen, I am sitting in that beautiful building that we call it the new seminary, also in Baltimore at 5400 Roland Avenue. So it's about four and a half miles north of the Packer Street campus that we'll be speaking of. That campus did shut down in 1969 and all seminary activities were transferred over to the new campus you see on your left. I say new, it was built in 1929. So I'd like to say just a few words quickly about St. Mary's. And um, so St. Mary's moved from the original Packard Street Seminary building to Roland Park in 1929. St. Mary's, which was founded in 1791 in Baltimore, Maryland, is the birthplace for priestly formation in the United States as the nation's first Roman Catholic seminary. Now is then, St. Mary's has as its primary purpose 
provide outstanding human, spiritual, intellectual, and pastoral preparation for candidates for the Roman Catholic priesthood. Following the Sulpician Seminary tradition, St. Mary seeks to do this as a formational community grounded in Jesus Christ and primarily directed toward diocesan, priestly, and pastoral ministry in the church. The men studying at St. Mary today are guided by the same Sulpician charism, as the same principles and values that guided Blessed Michael J. McGivney in 1877. Father Philip J. Brown, the Sulpician President Rector of St. Mary's Seminary today notes, we take great pride in Father McGivney's acknowledgement that his years of formation at St. Mary's in the Sulpician tradition, serving as defining influence on his vocation and lifelong commitment to serve others as a parish priest. Providing the people of God with the kind of pastors they deserve, pastors like Michael J. McGivney, is the defining mission of St. Mary's. So now that you know where I'm speaking from, we will get into who are the Sulpicians? This is something when anybody comes to Packer Street to take a tour, like who are the Sulpicians? And I could go on and on for many, many minutes, but I want to make sure that I'm keeping to my time. Sulpicians were founded by Reverend John Jacques Ollier in 1641, and he was the pastor of the, the Cathedral of San Sulpice in Paris, France. And the society was actually named after that parish, reflecting upon the idea of them being parish priests. And if you look to the right, the Mary Seat of Wisdom statue, the Sulpicians have kind of taken this on as, as they're, um, they're very much associated with that throughout the United States. And you see that, that symbol of, of wisdom and a symbol of learning, the possibility is that that is a Sulpician institution. The United States started off as a mission, and that mission was headed by Father Francois Nago, and it was at the basically the insistence or the the, the direction of the provincial superior at the time, Jacques Andre Emery, and it was basically I'll get into this a little bit more, but the United States was a mission of the French province until 1907, when the United States became its own province. So the beginnings are very small, but I wanted to introduce the listeners just to the two people very associated with them coming to the United States. So the Sulpician charism, what is it? What, what, what guides them as men who form, as priests who form young men into priests? And as you can see, it's a commitment to ministerial priesthood the cultivation of a popular spirit, an emphasis on spiritual formation, the creation of a formational community, and the exercise of congeniality. And it's noted that they are a society of priests and not an order. So they are diocesan priests that are called in to become teachers of young men to become priests. And they, they get their philosophy from the French school of spirituality. And I want to really just, boy, I am glossing over an incredible movement within the Catholic Church, just to give some context of why they, who they are and why they came to Baltimore and why Michael J. McGivney crossed paths with them. So distilling it way down, it was, a movement in the late 16th century in France where priests were beginning to realize that young men coming out of the seminary were not very well guided. Bishops were very hands off. Oftentimes bishops were not around to provide these young men with, with spiritual guidance. And so there was a movement to really focus in on priestly formation. And there are some things, as you can see on the slide, it's a deep mystical experience. 
and to detailed and well-adapted method for instructing others and a special concern for the dignity of priests, their holiness and their formation. And I, I so want to give a quote from Jean-Jacques Ollier, who founded the Society of Sans Peace, but I don't want to do a lot of reading for you. And I hope that just this taste of the French, spiritual, French school of spirituality initiates others to look into this wonderful movement within the Catholic Church. But if I can leave you with a concise soundbite on the French school of spirituality, I can simply say it is based on supreme focus on Jesus, the incarnate word of God. And that, I hope, is what you can take away from just this very brief introduction to the French school of spirituality. So there were four priests that were involved in the movement, the, the thought behind this French school of spirituality. And I will, these are the four priests involved with that. And if you look on the next slide, two of those priests actually are considered the founders of this school, going by Reverend Charles de Condren and St. John Eudes. And from that, the Sulpicians took their philosophy and their, what we call the Sulpician tradition of priestly formation. And boy, that is just touching the surface of a wonderful movement in the Catholic Church. I, I hope it spurs people to look into this further. So the Sulpicians have not only influenced uh, blessed Michael J. McGivney, but they've also had been able to guide other people in, very significantly in, in their devotion to Jesus Christ and, and service in his name. Uh, Father Luis de Borg had enormous influence over Elizabeth Ann Seton, who was called from New York following her return trip from Italy to live and start a school in the seminary or in the building next to the seminary. And so she took up the offer and she arrived down in Baltimore in 1808. She only stayed in the little building that we now call the Mother Seton House for less than one year. But it was in that time that she discerned her vocation and eventually went out to Western Maryland to form the Daughters of Charity of St. Joseph's. Then Father Hubert had influence over another very significant woman, and that's Mother Mary Elizabeth Lang, who was a woman of color who came to Baltimore, and the Sulpicians, being educators themselves, noticed that this, this little woman has a lot of education, and she began worshiping in the lower chapel of the seminary chapel, and devoted herself to God and, and discerned her vocation. But then she said, I don't have anywhere that I can, I don't have an order to join. No, no order would have me. And, they, and Father Joubert said, I'll help you start your own. And so with his, with his help and his guidance, she founded the Oblate Sisters of Providence in 1829, which was the first order for women of color in the world. And we're happy to say that she is now venerable Mother Elizabeth Lang. So we're very excited about that. And a co-founder of the Oblate Sisters was Sister Teresa Maxis Dushman, who went uh, off to Monroe, Michigan, and she became the founder of the Sister Servants of the Immaculate Heart of Mary in 1845. So there are some truly wonderful people associated with both the Sulpician's guidance and the, our little chapel in, in Packer Street. And again, these, each, each of these women and each of these two priests have incredible stories among themselves. And you can certainly check out our website and, and learn more about them individually. So why Baltimore? So if you look at the map in the frame, Basically, what you're seeing is a map of the United States and everything 
below the Diocese of Quebec was the Diocese of Baltimore up until 1808. A massive swath of land made even more massive after the Louisiana Purchase. And basically it's because of this gentleman who is considered the founder of the colony of Maryland, Sir Cecil Calvert. And through his rather enlightened for the time guidance, they came up with the Maryland Toleration Act of 1649. And it made Maryland, which was primarily a Catholic colony to begin with, but it was the first law establishing religious tolerance in the British North American colony. So this was a place of refuge for people who were persecuted in their home countries. And being primarily Catholic, it became the center of Catholicism in the colonies. So now we went through a revolutionary war and Bishop John Carroll of the United States, who had to go to England to be ordained a bishop because nobody in North America had that elevation yet, comes back and he's now the Bishop of the Diocese of Baltimore. Problem is, there's 35 priests who administer that entire swath of land that was in that picture. That's all of the United States, and that's a problem. So what to do? Well, at the same time, there's the French Revolution going on in France, and clergy were targeted by the masses, and as a matter of fact, 11 Sulpicians were martyred during this time. So, and ultimately, the seminaries and churches were shut down. So here you have a society of priests who form young men into priests by establishing seminaries. And here you have a bishop of a brand new country who needs to start forming priests in the country rather than waiting at the docks and hoping an ordained priest gets off and wants to stay in the United States. So Father Emery of the Sulpicians and Bishop Carroll got together and he invited the Sulpicians over to form what became the Sulpician Seminary and ultimately St. Mary's Seminary and University. So I always, when I give a tour, say what a win-win situation this was for, for both parties. So here we have what, this is a little bit before McGivney's time. So when they arrived in Baltimore, Bishop Carroll found them a recently closed tavern called One Mile Tavern. And they occupied it and they ended up purchasing it for about $2,600 at the time. And I'm not sure about the scale of money, whether or not that was a good deal or not. I'm not sure what that bought you in 1791. But um, it's, it's interesting to note that anybody who tours the site now, our, our site is ensconced within Baltimore City. Yet this was, at the time, one mile away from the city center. So you make it out this far, maybe give your horse some water, maybe have yourself a little glass of hard cider or two, and then go on your journey, basically on a line to York, Pennsylvania. So they bought this building and this became the first Roman Catholic seminary in the United States. They expanded upon that. And then in 1842, I'm sorry, in 1799, basically to make ends meet, the seminary was still not fully operational. They established St. Mary's College. And so they built a separate building on the property to house the college. And some of the most notable Baltimore sons at the time were alumni of St. Mary's College. And it was quite a prestigious institution. And it was up until 1842 when they decided that the seminary was, was, enough, was viable enough that they could concentrate on that. After all, they are 
tasked with forming young men into priests. They were not collegiate professors of a secular college. So they shut St. Mary's College down and then moved all of the seminary operations to the new campus. And that is, if you look straight ahead, so the, the chapel is to your right. And actually one of the outbuildings that they built off of this, the tavern is to your extreme right on the photo. And to the left is St. Mary's College, and it actually is where Michael McGivney had all of his seminary classes. Now, there is a newer building that was built in 1876, but we can't guarantee, he certainly saw it completed, but we don't know if he actually took classes in the final seminary building that was on the site until 1969. Uh, currently, this site is St. Mary's Park. The Sulpicians still have the chapel, the Mother Seton House, the spiritual center, which was the former convent for the nuns who worked at the seminary, as a collection of historic buildings, and it's now we have a pilgrimage center and an interpretive center. But the footprint around it was given to the city in 1975 for them to establish a green space for all time. So they can't build a carousel on it, they can't put anything else on it, it has to be a green space. So it is well enjoyed by the community. So this is St. Mary's Seminary Chapel, built in 1808. And this is the way Michael McGivney would have seen it at the time. The steeple that you see is actually made of wood and it was removed around 1914. So today it is just a brick building that people can see. The architect was Maximilian Godefroy, who was a contemporary of Latrobe's, Benjamin Latrobe's, and several churches, well, the First Unitarian Church down the street is also a Godefroy construction. And of course, Benjamin Latrobe designed the Baltimore Basilica. And an interesting note that the, the seminary chapel that you see and the Baltimore Basilica actually share a lot in common, including the same bricks. Uh, a, a, an interesting note was they ordered the bricks for the Baltimore Basilica, but it wasn't ready to go. And so the Sulpicians said, We're, we have the designs for our chapel, we'll buy those bricks. So they hauled them, it's only five blocks away, so it wasn't very far to go. They built their chapel and then they donated back the bricks that they didn't use back to the basilica. So there's a real DNA connection between these two buildings. And as a matter of fact, Archbishop John Carroll, who was elevated to Archbishop in 1808 with the establishment of the Diocese of Bardstown, when he died, he was buried at St. Mary's Seminary Chapel for 16 years until the basilica was completed and ready to receive his body as the first, first Archbishop of Baltimore. So we're getting now into McGivney's life as a seminarian of Pakistan, and everything was discerned by the tolling bell. The bell called them to prayers, the bell woke them up, the bell told them when they were going to be eating. It was all about the regiment of the bell. As a matter of fact, the bell you see is the seminary bell from St. Mary's in Tapestry. And we are hopefully going to be putting it up and actually using it. So that bell will hopefully ring out again after more than 50 years of being silent. So it's, it's, it's quite an artifact for us to have. And we're looking forward to putting it back up. So basically, if you I don't want to list everything that Michael McGivney would have studied as a priest, but you, you get a good look that it was a quite round, well-rounded education. Um, it was, of course, theology, but there was also many other things to study. And if you see back in that old system of getting his uh, his, his minor orders and and how that played out in, in the course of his daily life. 
And um, just really, I'll just have you all look at that. I don't want to talk over this because it does list very clearly the studies he would have had at St. Mary's at the time. And, um, and it's just interesting to me looking at this as cosmology, physics, chemistry, um, anthropology, a very interesting, well-rounded education. And this is something I will read, and you can read it along with me. I don't like to read a script, but this encapsulates an incredible look at actually St. Mary's Seminary. The rule of silence is strictly observed inside the seminary hall. No visiting from room to room is allowed. At dinner and supper, church history and the lives of the saints are read aloud. Formally, whenever the students went out into the world, that is, the streets of Baltimore, it was in regular processional form. But now, on Wednesdays, now mind you, this is 1897, not, we're not 100% sure this was exactly the case in Gibney's time. The only day of respite granted they may wander abroad in smaller company. At nine o'clock, every light in the seminary is extinguished and the students rise at five. The style of dress worn in the seminary is the Cossack, the Roman Cata, and the Beretta. It was a very regimented life. And I want to put up this picture. So this is actually St. Mary's Park on the southeastern part of the park. It's the only remaining original seminary wall. And also from the same article, you can read massive seminary building stands isolated in the heart of Baltimore, with gloomy stone trimming half concealed by many trees. It's pretty little chapel hidden by the great glass top wall, which extends all around the seminary. And we've actually had alumni who come we have one in particular who likes to bring his um his rcia group every year and he he's an older guy and he was here before vatican ii and he loves to tell the story and he always has his own little joke he goes yeah you know that that wall was topped with shards of broken glass that were set in concrete very much in the french style this is how french built walls at the time and he looks at you with a gleam in his eye and he goes, we're not sure what was really in the seminary to steal. So was that wall keeping people out or were they trying to keep seminarians in? And he always lets people ponder that. So that wall actually went around the entire campus. And there are actually older people in the neighborhood who thought that the seminary was a hospital. Because as because of the seminarians weren't allowed outside, other than in very formal groups, all the people in the neighborhood saw were nuns and priests coming in and out, and they assumed it was a hospital. So, and most hospitals at the time were staffed by nuns. So that kind of made sense since it wasn't they had this wall all the way around it. So it was quite a life of solitude and study and focus on the vocation chosen. Well, these are some images of what the chapel looked like in Michael McGivney's time. And what's interesting enough is when you get to the slide of what it looks like today, it kind of looks the same. The only thing that's been removed are the choir stalls, which they are not period to the building. They were built later on, and basically they were removed for practicality's sake. And if you look to the right in the background, you can see the final seminary building, the grand seminary building that was finished in 1876. So again, there could be that Michael McGivney had classes there, but we're really not sure if it was finished in time for him to have classes there. He certainly saw that. And that massive building fronted the Packard Street and again was raised to the ground in 1975 to make way for the park. So what's interestingly enough is people always think of nowadays being culturally diverse. And yet 
Michael McGivney was exposed to a very diverse group of young men while at the seminary. If you see on the graphic, 56% of the seminarian population of St. Mary's during Michael McGivney's time, time was from a different word. They were all from a different country. So there was a lot of cultural influences and a lot of language spoken around him. And it was just always interesting to me. People think that we're always getting more diverse. And yet, here it is all these years ago, an oasis of cultural diversity in Baltimore. And these are definitely from Michael McGivney's time. You can see the, the, the garb of the seminarians with their berettas and their tactics. And again, you can see in the background in the upper right, St. Mary's Seminary Chapel. And sadly, the one on the left is one of the former seminarian buildings seminary buildings that had been raised to the ground for the park. And these are some views of Baltimore at the time. Now, we're really not sure how McGivney got from Connecticut to Baltimore. Speculation is could certainly be train or by boat. And if he came in by train, chances are he came to Camden Station in Baltimore which is still in existence, and it's incorporated now into the Baltimore Orioles baseball park. And their offices are actually in the form of Camden Station building. And to the right, you can see the Baltimore base, the harbor base, where all the ships docked. Nowadays, that's the uh, downtown inner harbor development. And most of those docks have been filled in, actually, by landfill. And also the National Aquarium is pretty much right in the center of that picture. But coming from Waterbury and me knowing Waterbury very well from growing up, very similar in industry. Um, I know what Waterbury was the, they considered the brass capital of the world and kind of a similar projection of development up until World War II and then as industry declined, the city declined and kind of had to reinvent themselves in parallel. And I'm sure New Haven and Baltimore being port cities, very, very similar. So I think McGivney might have been at home here, at least in regard to industry development. Uh, of course, we do have, sadly, at the time, Michael McGivney was, was a seminarian and vocations were up during that time. So there were a lot of seminarians. So what we have really are just proof that he did, in fact, earn his minor orders as a priest. And you can see from these that came out of the Associated Archives here at St. Mary's Seminary that uh, most of them were actually given, bestowed upon him right at St. Mary's Seminary Chapel, where he would pray every day couple were down the street at the Baltimore Basilica. So these are wonderful things to have, but they're still just basically notations in ledgers. So, but it, it shows that he went through the system and earned, earned his minor orders here. And of course, this culminated with the Gibney's ordination on December 22nd, 1877, Again, right down the street at the Baltimore Basilica, which has been beautifully restored back to its original Benjamin Latrobe design. And it's a wonderful piece. It's a very uniquely American interpretation of a cathedral. And definitely, if you're down here, worth a visit just to see the remarkable dome and how it's supported in light. So very much, um, we hold Michael McGivney dear in Baltimore for many reasons. And of course, we always cherish the fact that he wrote to his uh, former rector, who was Alphonse Magnin, who was then the provincial superior for the Sulpicians. I remain his 
ever a fond and loving son of my own mind, yours in Christ. And so we're very happy that he looked upon his time here with, with a lot of love and respect. Of course, this is what the site looks like today. And it is open for tours. And it is very much what um, God of Corey designed in 1808 is what is seen today. As a matter of fact, those niches were empty when the chapel was built 212 years ago. And it was deemed that they will stay that way hopefully for another 212 years. But it's a beautiful neo-Gothic, first example of neo-Gothic architecture in the United States and a wonderful piece of remaining Catholic history in the United States. So as a seminary chapel, the upper chapel was only for priests and seminarians. And basically because there is no delineation between the altar and the pews, it's all considered to be sacred. So only clergy, to go up to the upper chapel. And you can see on the left, it has been restored as close to its 1808 appearance as could be, right down to the paint. It's as white as white got in 1808 along, along the walls. And the lower chapel, the Chapelle Boss, was for the lady. And what's interesting enough, without getting too much off the topic of the Gibney's time, the lady at the time surrounding St. Mary's were Haitian refugees in their revolution. So this was a unique place where people of color of the time could congregate freely without any kind of repercussion. It was nearly a unique place in Baltimore, which was part of Maryland, which was a slaveholding state. And so Pichon said, if you believe, you are welcome here. They were men of God and they were men of education. So they considered it to be very important that this chapel was open to all. And of course, this is how Mother Mary Lang ended up associated with the Sulpicians. She made her way here and ultimately took her vows right in front of that altar, as did Mother Seton and Mother Dushiman, and all three discern their vocation in this room, which is a remarkable sacred place. And these are the other buildings currently on the property. That is to the left, the 1808 Mother Seton House. It is one of the most original structures from that time in the United States. Most of the doors inside are original. The floors are original. The window class were original. The applewood railing that Mother Seton herself would have held on to going up and down the stairs is original to the property. So it is quite an amazing piece of history and church, sacred church history that the Sulpicians have preserved. And that is also open for pilgrimages and tours and is a quite a remarkable place. And this is all interpreted by the visitor center, which the Sulpician directed in 2009. So I want to just end with, again, emphasizing the continuity of this venerable institution that is St. Mary's Seminary and University. First seminary in the United, Roman Catholic seminary in the United States, and it is still today forming young men into priests. So it's, it's quite a venture and quite important to Catholic development in the United States from the inception of the United States. So Peter, I didn't think I could be that concise, but I think I did it within a good time limit. And we just like to urge everyone, if you're in Baltimore, to see the, the St. Mary Spiritual Center and Historic Center on Pakistan. And certainly our website will explain more of these 
figures in Catholic history better than I could have gotten into in, in the time we have together tonight. So I want to certainly thank Peter Sonsky and, and the Knights of Columbus for this opportunity to give you a very brief look into McGivney's time here in Baltimore. So thank you. Blaine, thank you as well. We're very grateful once again for your pinch hitting, if you would, for Deacon Vito and, and continue to pray for his uh, quick return to health. Thank you know, what's I fascinating what, What's fascinating uh, to me really is the, the significance of this site that McGivney was formed at. Um, Elizabeth Bailey Seaton, who uh, started the Catholic school uh, movement in the United States, her very first location for uh, an elementary school was in that house that rests right on the same site as uh, Father McGivney Seminary. Mother Lang, who you mentioned, um, of uh, Haitian origin and founded the, the first uh, order of uh, African-American women in the United States, now a venerable uh, on her path to sainthood. So we've got uh, Mother Lang on the path to sainthood. We've got Father McGivney just having achieved his beatification. He's uh, already uh, a significant way towards sainthood. And Mother Seton, Mary, Mother uh, Elizabeth Seton, already a saint. Three mm -hmm. very significant figures. And uh, I'll note one of the one of the uh, viewers, uh, I think, was confused. You said, is it Mother Mary Dushman who was under uh, Mother Lang and then founded another order? Well, she, she, was, she heard uh, Rose Phil Philippine Duchenne. Um, mm, okay. Um, I was under, uh, I understand that uh, it was Sister Therese, Teresa Maxis Dushman. And she was called out to actually administer to French speaking women in Monroe, Michigan. And I believe, and boy, I don't want to step on toes here, but she was the founder of the Sister Servants of the Immaculate Heart of Mary in 1845. Okay, say the name again once more, please. Teresa. Teresa Maxis Duchin, M A X I S. And she had initially been an oblate of. Um... Yes, she was in the original formation of the oblates, and she was a very young woman, and she rose up to actually become provincial superior of the oblate sisters when she got her calling to go out west. Okay. Splendid. There. Now, I, I, I don't want to speak about something I'm not 100% sure of, but I know that there were some issues with the IHMs with, with, with Mother Dushman, who I believe was, was, she had to go live somewhere else for a while, but then she was invited back in. And I don't know if that's part of the confusion, and I really I don't want to muddy the waters on that. On that topic. That's fine. Um, I, I think it was just uh, mishearing a name that sounded very similar and and both uh, of French origin. The other thing that's important to note, you had shared uh, documents, copies of documents of all of the minor orders that Father McGivney received while he was there at St. Mary's, and you noted that many of them came uh, in the uh, in the seminary chapel. But uh, what's also interesting to note is that uh, some of those were conferred by a Bishop Bailey. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Bishop Bailey was the nephew of Mother Seton because Mother Seton was Elizabeth Bailey Seton. Um, you're putting me on the spot on that one. Well, I note him there in uh, in 1875 uh, and 1874, conferring a couple of these. Uh, uh, also, 1876, a subdiaconate. Uh, so, uh, we'll we'll go with uh, his his relation as a nephew to Mother Seton. So, okay. uh, again, a, a close connection between Father McGivney and uh, Mother Elizabeth Seton. Not just uh, not just having. Uh, resided on the same property and been uh, and worshiped in the same chapel, but uh, also this connection through uh, through her family as well. Um, well, I also and, found, and, and, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was I was also going to point out very significantly, you noted that. This was a mission church 
we were a young nation and a young church. You noted, I think it was 35 priests that were serving under Bishop Carroll when he came back after being consecrated in the UK. And, you know, in, in, in attracting uh, members of the clergy to the United States, many came from foreign lands as priests already, as you alluded to, but it was also um, important to continue to form priests. And so the establishment of the seminary in Baltimore, very logical, and the uh, persuasion of uh, men who had uh, been born in other lands, but who were Catholic and looking for an opportunity to serve in the priesthood to come as, um, as missionary priests, if you will, or missionary seminarians to study here and uh, to uh, provide the sacraments for the faithful here in this new land in, in the United States. And uh, what a lot of people don't realize, too, is when Elizabeth Van Seton went out to Emmitsburg, which is a very small town even nowadays in Western Maryland, she wasn't just going out west to nowhere. She was actually going out to what was almost the frontier at the time, where there were other Sulpician priests that she knew would take care of her. So they were, they, these, these priests were, excuse me, they were certainly men who were not afraid to go out into the unknown. And they did their evangelization, evangelization out in the wilderness. So it's, it's a pretty amazing story that isn't told enough about how these, these early priests just braved everything. I mean, you hear the stories about the Lewis and Clark expedition only a few years before where people thought that it might be dinosaurs out west. They, they didn't know. So it is pretty amazing. Blaine, have you any sense about, uh, you, you mentioned uh, toward the beginning of your presentation that Maryland was founded as a state, as a, uh, a state that uh, provided for religious tolerance. And so it attracted many Catholics because mm -hmm. uh, those that are familiar with early American history know that uh, Catholicism um, found it uh, unfriendly at times as, as Catholics were moving to the United States. Have you any idea just how Catholic the city of Baltimore was? What percentage of the population uh, called themselves Catholic? Here, I, I, I don't know that percentage. Everything that happened regarding Catholicism started in Maryland and Baltimore became quickly the, uh, the main city of this Catholic friendly colony. But as far as percentage goes, I, I don't know. Um, again, we know from some of the diaries of the early Sulpicians at St. Mary's that they were surrounded by. Haitian Catholics, I mean, they, they arrived in a world that was surrounded by Catholicism. So I, I don't know as far as beyond their recollections, as far as numbers for that. So clearly it was a city that had many uh, established uh, Catholic uh, facilities. Yes. You said the, uh, the seminary, we, we noted that uh, also the uh, the Basilica, which was at the time the cathedral, was uh, under planning and, and under construction um, in, a, in a similar era to the seminary. And so it would naturally would have attracted a lot of Catholics to that area, mm -hmm. uh, notably Mother Lang and uh, her community. Um, what is the status of the Oblate Sisters of Providence today? Do they do they still exist and minister in Baltimore? Well, they still exist. Their their mother house is actually about give or take five miles west of Packer Street. And although they 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 did reach a point where they were establishing schools in Haiti, Cuba, and various other foreign countries. They have pulled back on many of those 
and but they still run St. Francis Academy here in Baltimore, which is a highly successful school. And really that's their pride and joy. And it's one of the pride and joys of Baltimore because of its high education. And it's it's also giving a lot of kids that are underprivileged a chance at a really quality education. Um, I can say too, give a little accolade to the Archdiocese of Baltimore. They are building their first school in 60 years, and it's the Mother Lang School. And it's about maybe three quarters of a mile down the road from Packer Street. So we'll be looking forward to working with them and introducing their names, their school namesake to where she actually founded her order and really changed the world with her very bold act at the time. If you look at all of the, the three women of Packer Street, they were incredibly progressive for their time. I would almost say progressive for our time. And they really found a place with the Saltesians that they could exercise that progressiveness and that and that boldness to to uh, serve God in the way that they were called. Well, certainly they had uh, a familiarity with the Sulpicians in uh, in language. Uh, to be sure, Father McGivney had an awful lot of exposure to French language. Uh, he studied, as we noted, in uh, the French region of Canada. Uh, at the early stages of his uh, seminary career. Uh, he studied in Niagara University in Western New York, but notably that community was run by the Vincentian priests. And they were, again, a French order founded by St. Vincent de Paul. He came to Baltimore and he had uh, more uh, French influence from the Sulpicians. And uh, so it's, it's really noteworthy because a part of his reason for going to Canada as a seminarian in his uh, earliest days of studies was because there had been such an influx of immigrants coming from that French region of Canada into the New England area where Father McGivney resided and where he was studying for the Diocese of Hartford, which at that time encompassed all of the states of Connecticut and Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. uh, many Many Canadians were coming to the United States post US Civil War because there was opportunity for employment. Uh, a number of deaths had resulted from the Civil War and a number of openings were there at textile mills and other manufacturing centers. So um, as Catholics and as, as faithful Catholics, uh, the Bishop of Hart was Hartford was seeking priests who would become familiar with their culture and uh, and be able to very uh, readily minister to them as they settled in his region. So that was a, a, a wonderful uh, coincidence, if you will, that uh, here's a, a son of Ireland. His, his parents have come here from uh, Ireland as immigrants themselves. And uh, he's he's encountered so many other immigrants already in a young nation. But what's also this, uh, worthy of note is I'm sure that a lot of the formation that Father McGivney received from the good priests in Baltimore, the Sulpicians, as well as elsewhere, uh, helped him to develop that outreach that was so characteristic in the Knights of Columbus, that charitable outreach and that real desire to unite men in faith we noted that Catholicism uh, often posed uh, problems for immigrants as they were coming. They were looked at with uh, suspicion. They were uh, denied jobs and opportunity for advancement in society. And uh, there was always a temptation perhaps to, to stray from the faith. And McGivney wanted very much to keep them uh, strong in the faith. And a part of his founding the Knights of Columbus was to unite them, to band them together so that they could be mutually supportive uh, of one mm -hmm. another's families, as well as to be good examples for one another in the practice of their Catholic faith. Um, a Sulpician priest made it very clear to me one day, he was giving his own tour in our chapel, and that Sulpicians think laterally towards the community, not hierarchically and 
to where they are in the church. And there is a line that was directly from John Jacques writing and it says, it's necessary for the soul to be in fear and distrust of self. And that was a guiding principle of his ideas to take the thoughts of the French school of spirituality and ultimately found, found the Society of Sound for Peace. And their, their, their methodology of, of teaching has come under some scrutiny as the church has gone through several phases, but it's very strong right now and very relevant to the, to the current situation in the world. So it was a sound philosophy to take the time. Blaine, I have one last question I'd like to pose to you sure. before we uh, wrap up our session tonight. The, um, there was an inquiry about whether McGivney's family would have uh, ventured to Baltimore at all to pay a visit during his time there. Um, I have no record of it from any of the research that I've done about Father McGivney of his receiving his family there. I suppose it's possible that he may have returned on occasion to Connecticut during the course of his studies. Um, do you have any record of whether that was a common practice in the time? Um, I'm going to say based on what we know about seminary life then, probably not. Um, it's kind of, it was understood that back in, certainly in his time, seminarians came in at the beginning of the semester and those doors shut behind them and they didn't go out except for what you heard about in, in the presentation where they were guided by a priest and they were pretty much directed straight to the basilica in procession to celebrate mass there and come right back. So this wasn't an avenue to have parents day or parents come down. I, I imagine traveling also at that time was prohibitively expensive. So conjecture is that no, they, they didn't see him at the seminary or visit. And he only saw them at the end of the semester. So sure. yet another sacrifice that these seminarians would have had to make to be absent from family uh, and yeah. very, very dedicated to study. You really have to be, this, this was the vocation, the sacred vocation chosen and the price you pay. Blaine, I mentioned at the outset that this is the fourth in a series of biographical talks about Father McGivney. We've talked about his time in New Haven, his time in Waterbury, Thomaston, now Baltimore. I want to say that in two weeks' time, on the 10th of March, we'll be focusing on Father McGivney's time in western New York. He was a student in Niagara University, Our Lady of the Angels Seminary, and uh, two individuals from... Uh, Our Lady of the Angels, or more specifically, Niagara University, will talk about uh, what uh, McGivney would have encountered while he was there at, uh, at Niagara, very close to Niagara Falls. So that's March 10th, and um, I'll send to all of our audience members a link so that they can register for that session via email. And also, if you'd like to download that resource sheet that I mentioned, and there'll be a link on that sheet as well so that you can uh, make your registration for that session two weeks from now. Blaine, I thank you very much for your willingness to participate, your knowledge in sharing with us. And uh, I, I encourage having visited St. Mary's Spiritual Center on Pack Street, the beautiful chapel, the Mother Seton House, uh, a fantastic place to tour, as you, as you note, so uh, well-preserved, uh, a, a tremendous opportunity for Catholic families or anyone uh, traveling through. And it's really in a, a, a very uh, quaint area of Baltimore, something that in itself is very instructive. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you, Blaine. I would I would share with thank you that you. it's our custom to uh, to close with the prayer for Father McGivney's canonization. And uh, so I have some slides that uh, have the prayer, and I'll invite the audience to uh, pray along with us, and and invite you to as as well, Blaine, if you want. So this is the thank prayer you. for the canonization of Blessed Michael McGivney in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Amen. God, our Father protector of the poor and defender of the widow and orphan, you called your priest, Blessed Michael McGivney, 
to be an apostle of Christian family life and to lead the young to the generous service of their neighbor. Through the example of his life and virtue, may we follow your son Jesus Christ more closely, fulfilling his commandment of charity and building up his body, which is the church. Let the inspiration of your servant prompt us to greater confidence in your love so that we may continue his work of caring for the needy and the outcast. We humbly ask that you glorify blessed Michael McGivney on earth according to the design of your holy will. Through his intercession, grant the favor I now present. Through Christ our Lord, amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Blaine Carvalho, God bless you. Good night. Thank you very uh, Deacon, much, Peter. Deacon Vito, speedy return to health. And uh, we'll, hopefully we'll our audience will see tomorrow. Knowing him, he'll be at work tomorrow. <laughs> and our audience, we hope to see you two weeks from tonight. Well, thank God you again bless. for this opportunity, Peter. Thank you. God bless. So long. Okay. Bye-bye now.